Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. I'm really excited about this brand new series. It's on the book of Exodus. Exodus, you know, if you go back and look at your Bible, Genesis, Exodus, it's the second book of the Bible. We're going to study it from the beginning to the end. Uh, this is going to be a four-part series. Myself and Pastor Josh are going to be sharing the responsibilities of this series. And then next month in September, we have a, a, a great series coming out. It's called Branded. Branded. And just to give you a little heads up, Family Church is rebranding. And in September, we'll be launching that new brand with a new logo, new language, uh, new t-shirts, all that kind of stuff. We're pretty excited about what God is doing here at Family Church. <laughs> this series on the book of Exodus is going to be in what's called the teacher voice. Okay, so the way that we preach here at Family Church, we reach the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Right, there's five gifts that the Bible talks about that have been given to the church. And every single one of you have one of those gifts, just so you know. All right, it's either apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're called to be a pastor or be an evangelist. It just means that the gifting is within you. Uh, I'm saying vocationally, you know, not full-time ministry, but that is within you. And when you are taught in your voice, it's going to be the best series you've ever heard, right? We get it all the time. Man, that's the best sermon that you ever preached. Well, probably not, but it was the voice that ministers to you because you heard it in your certain way, your personality. So this is in the teacher. This is going to be a little bit deeper dive. There's going to be a little bit more research, a little bit more study, a little bit more revelation of Scripture. And today, the key verse is coming to us out of Exodus 2, verse 23. And then i got to give you context. During a long period of time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and they cried out to God. And their cry for help of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groanings. God did what? Heard. God heard. They cried out. They prayed. God heard. And he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. That's where we're going to lead off today. Father, we thank you for this time. As we get into your, we pray that you open the eyes of our understanding. Enlighten us to your truth. Show us things to come in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm going to be honest. I preached so hard, I lost my voice a little bit. So going to be a little bit raspy. Going to sound a little bit like a rocker. Is that all right? Um, I'm not going to ask by a show of hands, but I'm sure many of you have either seen the show or seen a t-shirt or heard about a series on TV called Yellowstone. Yellowstone. Anybody heard this? Yellowstone? Don't raise your hand. Don't admit to it. It's not good. If you watch it, you're in sin. It's a horrible show. Just kidding. But it's taken the nation by storm. We were driving from New York down to Florida last week. We had a, uh, our tech, uh, the church's tech company had an install down in Florida, and we stopped at this gas station called Bucky's. Anybody ever stop at a Bucky's? Dude, it's like the super Walmart of gas stations. It's crazy. But anyway, Bucky's has a section just for Yellowstone, Yellowstone t-shirts and hats. So I was actually going to pick up a cowboy hat and come out kind of like dressed like Yellowstone, but I thought that it might be a little sacrilegious since it's not a wholesome show to watch. My point being is this, in TV culture today, when a movie or a TV series is a hit, in order for them to make more money, they go back and create another movie or another series called a prequel, a prequel. And the story of Exodus and Moses and the children of Israel has a prequel. It has a story before the story. And in order for us to understand the fullness of the story, we got to go back and understand the beginning of the story of where Exodus came from. Exodus' prequel is based on a man named Joseph. Anybody ever heard of Joseph? Joseph was the guy with the technicolor coat, the coat of many colors. He was honored by the king. He made a place for himself, or God made a place for himself to the right hand of the king. But Joseph dies. And then the king dies. And there's a new king that's put into place, and this new king does not know Joseph. 
He does not know what the relationship between the previous king and Joseph was. And Joseph really had made a place for the children of Israel in Egypt. He had, he had had security for them and jobs for them. But this new king that comes in is a very poor leader. He's a very poor leader. Poor leaders are insecure about the success of people that work for them. Poor leaders, insecure leaders, will put a lid on you, will put a cap on you. They won't take your ideas. They won't take any influence. In fact, they become fearful that someone else is going to rise up and try to take their job. Great leaders put people in position to take their job. Great leaders understand that if I raise you up to take my job, I get a promotion. Okay. We don't understand that. Okay. So let's look at this. In Exodus, let's go back. Exodus 1 verse 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, now, see what they just did? That's like racism right there. He said to his people about those people, segregation, you're not my people. I'm going to talk to my people about your people. So he said to his people, look at those people, the children of Israel. They are more, there's more of them, and they are mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them. Instead of saying, let's make an alliance with them, that we can partner with them and continue to invest in them so they're part of us. No, poor leadership. Poor leader, insecure leader. Let's, so let's deal shrewdly with them lest they multiply and it happens in the event of war that they join another army and come against us. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with burdens. And they built for Pharaoh supply cities in Pithom, in Ramis, but the more they were afflicted, the more they multiplied and grew. You don't get that. The more garbage they went through, the more God blessed them. The harder life got, the more they prospered. You know, isn't it crazy? Like, so many times we give up on God in the middle of the crap. We give up, where are you, God. Well, I'm trying to multiply you and bless you in the middle of the burden. In the middle of the process, I'm trying to anoint you and encourage you. And so many times, man, we have like Christian entitlement and we walk out on God in the middle of him working a blessing for us. The more they were dealt with, the more they were afflicted, the more they prospered. That's what God does. Don't let affliction steal from you what God is trying to do for you. We get so, so many times, we get so focused on the affliction that we don't look at the God who is going to bring us through that situation. So let me, let's understand this. God did not afflict them. A crummy, insecure leader afflicted them. God did not afflict them. In fact, it was not God's plan that they be afflicted. If it was God's plan for them to be afflicted, he would not have created a way for them to get out of affliction. If this was man's plan or the enemy's plan or whatever you want, however you want to look at it. But when that plan began to, to go in that same direction, God began to bless them and God created a plan to get them out of it. You got to believe in God for that. You gotta believe in God when something comes into your life that looks like affliction, that God is already beginning a plan to get you out of it. Come on, somebody. Might I add that maybe if you have experienced hard times in your life, one, it's either because you made some stupid mistakes, or two, it's because the enemy is afraid of who you're going to be. Because if the enemy can stop you now, you'll never get to who God created you to be. Come on, somebody. There's never a great victory without first having a great battle. Great battles produce great victors. And I know this sounds crazy. Well, I just, I don't want to have any battles. I don't want to have anything. But then you're never going to be known as a great victor. Come on, come on, come on, come on. 
See, see, the situation is this, is that the battle was never supposed to be yours. The Bible says that he goes before you and that the battle belongs to the Lord. All right, let's move on. Exodus 2.23. I told you I'm going to preach today. It's teacher voice, but I'm going to preach it because I don't know any other way. During a long period of time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery. They cried out to God, and God heard them. So God is there in the very midst of their affliction. And what the passage doesn't say is the passage does not say that God was deafened to their cry. It says that God heard them. You must believe. You must believe that when you pray, God hears you. Okay, and I'm just gonna throw it out, straight logic, straight logic. You're insane if you pray believing that God didn't hear you. Like, you're literally insane. Like, because you're wasting your time doing something you don't think is gonna happen. So I'm gonna tell you this, don't even waste your time. If you don't have faith that God hears you when you pray, don't waste your time. Don't bother praying. Because you're literally handcuffing yourself. Faith is the catalyst that breaks the prayer request through the heavens. The Bible says that I prayed, but the angels were waging war in the heavenlies. Well, what pushes that through is your faith. Faith is the catalyst for change in your life. Got to have faith. Got to have faith. It says this, that God heard them and God cared about them. God heard and God cared. And, and, and you know, here, here's the situation in our lives. We all know our mess. We all know our history channel. We all know what we've done. We all know the thoughts that go through our minds. So many times, we don't believe God cares because we actually don't care about ourselves. And we put that on him. We don't even bother asking God. Because we don't think he's going to answer us because of what we know about ourselves. That's not our God. That's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's not this God. That's some religious God that you heard somebody teach about. And it's not reality. It's not true. It's not true. God, God's ear is never deafened to the cry of the righteous. Go look it up. Go look it up. We see this narrative throughout the entire Bible that God is not separated from the pain of his people. And that's really the only reason why I could believe in this religion or this, this belief system. It is the only belief system that the God of creation came to earth and was afflicted by the same pains that I will experience. I could put my faith in a God like that. I cannot put my faith in a God that has never felt what I felt as a human being. Couldn't do it. You don't know what I'm going through. You might be somewhat all-knowing, but you didn't experience it. Our God did. Our God experienced every single thing that you will feel in your body, he experienced it so that he can identify with that situation. So these people are in slavery, they're in bondage, all their rights are taken away, they're in pain, they're struggling. And God says, okay, I'm gonna formulate a plan that I could fix myself, but I'm not going to. We all know this, God is almighty. He is omnipotent, he is omniscient. He's in all places knowing all things and he's all powerful. God could go flick and wipe out the Pharaoh, clear out the castle, and he, he could do all that. But he says, no, I want you to be the hero in the narrative of heaven. So he says, I will have human involvement to solve my problems. Let me give you an example. Has anybody ever made their kids a hero of a situation that they could have easily done themselves? I'll give you an example. Opening a pickle jar. I love pickles. Opening a pickle jar. Sometimes that pickle jar is so hard to open, that suction on that lid, that little thing that has to pop open. So what I'll do with my kids, don't tell them, they're not watching. So what I'll do with my kids sometimes is I'll get it started so it's right there before the pop. And I'm like, oh, I can't get it. Can someone help me? And I hand the jar to one of my kids, and they go, pop. And they're like, ah, I'm stronger than you, dad. <coughs> they're a hero. 
They solved the problem that I could have easily solved myself. But I want to affirm their strength in them. I don't want to affirm they're a hero. And that's what God does for us. He puts us in places to be heroes and solve problems in this life that he could easily fix himself. But he wants to give you the confidence that God used me. God anointed me. God put me in a place to be a hero. Now today, I don't have time to get into the whole story of Moses' birth and how he was raised and how he got into this place of leadership. But you can go back and study Exodus 2. It's kind of long. It's worth studying. It's worth the read. So you can see some of his childhood woundings and how he was raised and what he went through. But I want to pick up the story a little bit later in um, where Exodus was a, a grown man. He's working for his father, Jethro. And if you read the story of Moses, you're going to see that Jethro actually has three different names. They all kind of mean something different, but for the point of today's story, Jethro is Moses' father-in-law, and he's tending over the flocks of his father-in-law, and an angel of the Lord appears to Moses. It's called the burning bush experience. Anybody ever heard the story of the burning bush? Okay. And literally, it, the Bible says that an angel of the Lord appeared, but it's actually Jesus Christ appears. But the Bible has to say an angel because Jesus has not descended as a human yet. So he's coming in a form to appear and speak to Moses, but because he hasn't come to this earth as a man yet, he has to come as an angel. And the study of this is called Christophany. Christophany means the, the appearance of Christ pre-incarnate, the pre-incarnate Christ. Another story is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. The, the, the Pharaoh looks in, he says, there's a fourth man in the fire, and it looks like the sons of God. And it was the pre-incarnate Christ. So God, Jesus himself, is appearing before Moses. Now watch this, Exodus 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flocks of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of the Midians, and he led a flock to the back of the desert, to the place of Horeb the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not being consumed. So there was flames around this thing, but it wasn't burning. And so Moses said, well, I will now turn and see this great sight. <laughs> this bush that does not burn. Oh, uh, that's, that's just kind of funny. I will see this strange sight, this tree that burns but does not burn, right? Let me give you a warning. If you're ever out hiking and you see a tree on fire but it ain't burning, you got two options. Run away or go say to yourself, I must investigate this thing that is a tree burning that does not burn. But if you pick the latter instead of the former, you go up to that tree that's on fire but not burning, I promise you your life is about to change. Your life's about to change. You are not going to leave that encounter the same person. So if you want to remain the same, run away. If you're ready for your life to be changed forever, approach the tree. Okay? And so he saw this thing, and uh, he starts to walk towards it. And when the Lord saw him turn to come walk to it, the Lord said to him, Moses, Moses. And Moses said back to him, here I am. Then the Lord said to him, do not draw near this place. Take off your shoes. Take the shoes off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon the Lord. This is actually the first of many miracles where, in, in the book of Exodus, where the laws of nature are suspended because God is doing a work. I want to point out a really cool point here that I like. It says that God told Moses to take off his sandals for the place where he was walking is holy ground. In these times, feet were kind of like a despicable thing because they wore open-toe sandals. They're main form of transportation were animals. 
and animals happen to go to the bathroom wherever they're walking. They don't have designated potty areas. And so people would walk through that stuff and it would be on their, in between their toes and on their feet and in their sandals and all those things. So, so God is saying, take your shoes off because this place is holy. Well, my shoes are probably cleaner than my feet, so like, what's going on here? And what I love about this is that God is not afraid of the dirtiest parts of who you are. God is not afraid of the dirtiest secret that you have in your mind. Come on, somebody. God is not afraid of the dirty parts of your life. In fact, when God calls you, he takes, he factors into the equation everything that you've ever done and everything that you're going to do, and he still says, qualified, I call you. He tells Moses to take his sandals off because God wants to come in contact with the dirtiest part of his life. You see, dirty things become clean when they come in contact with the holy things of God. Some of us who've been struggling with the same dirty things in our lives, it's probably because we've never taken the time to experience the presence of God. Come on, somebody. You're not going to overcome the dirtiest parts of your life by yourself. You've already shown that you don't have that discipline. He says, take off your shoes. Let the holiness of God come in contact with the dirty area of your life. Not only does he reach out to connect with Moses with the dirtiest parts of his life, but God then also reaches out to him in an act of love. We're going to get to that in a little bit. So he calls out to Moses. Verse 10 goes on to say this. Moses, I'm going to send you. I'm sending you to Pharaoh, to lead my people out of bondage, out of slavery, out of persecution, out of affliction. And how does Moses respond? Yes, I've been training for this moment my whole life. Thank you for the opportunity. No, he responds like 85% of us in the room would respond. No, thank you. Got the wrong guy. Got the wrong guy, right? 85% of people are introverts. They don't like conflict, they don't like confrontation. Don't sign me up for a fight. I'm the exact opposite. I like to fight, right? I like to argue. <laughs> I like to have conflict, not bad conflict, but I like to talk things out, hash it out, right? Like you got a problem with me, let's talk it out. Moats, I'm sending you to approach Pharaoh to get my people out of bondage. Got the, got, 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 got the wrong guy. Moses had a stuttering problem. He, 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 he stuttered a lot. He said, I want to, I'm not eloquent of speech. You got the wrong guy. God replies back to him. Uh, I'm sorry, Moses says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out? And God kind of responds this way. I didn't ask you who you were. I'm telling you who you are. A lot, of us, a lot of us think we know ourselves. We think we know what we're great at and what we're supposed to do. And God says, man, you don't know nothing about yourself. You're looking at yourself from your linear perspective. I'm telling you, I'm looking at you from a heavenly perspective. I know what I called and anointed you to do. And you're settling for a life that's far below it. You're settling for depression. You're settling for anxiety. You're settling to be angry. You're settling to have no peace. You're settling for these things. But that's not who I created you to be. I know what I created. I know what I created. You're not living it. You're not living it. But see, that's also the gracious side of God. He's never going to make you. Moses could have still walked away. Moses could have walked away. Moses says, who am I? He says, that's beside the point. Know who I am. It doesn't matter who you are. It's about who I am. God is saying, I am the I am, and I called you. I am the I am, and I've anointed you. I am the I am, and I have a purpose and a plan and a destiny for your life. He's the I am. Our confidence needs to be in who's with us, 
not in what we are capable of doing in ourselves. Mm. I got to move on. We're out of time. Point number one today is this. God is calling out to you today. God is calling out to you today. So the first thing that happens in this story is God calls out to Moses. And how he does that is by setting a tree on fire that's not burning. That was the call out. Moses is walking. He sees this call out. He sees this tree on fire. I must investigate this thing. The same way God calls out to Moses, God's calling out to you today. And here's what I love about God's call out. It surpasses, it bypasses time. So God's calling out to you today. I promise you this. God is calling out to you today. Every single one of us in here, there's an element of this message that you needed to hear today. But in five years from now, when someone else finds this on YouTube and they're watching it that today, it was for them that day. That's the loveliness and the greatness of God. He bypasses time. And his today is every day. He's looking for more than just this generation to harvest from. He's looking for more generations. He says to us this in 1 Peter 2.9, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own possession. For what? To proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We're to be proclaimers of God's greatness. Now listen, you don't need to be a flaming Christian who's standing on a street corner proclaiming, but you proclaim it by his blessings. You proclaim it by the works that he's doing in your life. You proclaim it at the dinner table when you pray. You are, you are a proclamation of God's greatness. Mm. God's calling out to you. Well, no, Pastor Mike, I don't really know that I'm called by God to do anything great. Look what A.W. Tozer said. He says, the layman, which means a person who's not a professional preacher, the layman need never think of his humbler tasks as being inferior to that of his minister. Let every man abide in the calling wherein he's called or she is called, and his work will be sacred as the work of ministry. So whatever it is that you are doing, it is as sacred as my job up here on stage. If you're a mechanic, if you're a lawyer, if you're a doctor, if you're a union worker, if you're a stay-at-home mom, stay-at-home dad, if you're working online, when you do it unto the Lord, it is as sacred as being someone who's standing on stage preaching. He's, the one thing God has called you to be a light, a light where you are. Be a light, be a resource to those around you. Number two, God is reaching out to you today. Well, Pastor Mike, isn't that the same thing? God calling me and God reaching out? No, it's not. I got this dog named Gemma. She's a boxer. I love her. She's like the kissiest dog. I love her. Somewhat stupid, but a great dog. I love her. That dog gets out of my backyard, she's gone. And she will not come to my command. I'm working on it. I got a lot of treats. We've been working on it. But I, when I say, Gemma, Gemma, that's me calling out to her. But when she draws near to me and I reach out, that's a touch. I reach out to touch her and hold her and bring her to me and pet her, kiss on her squishy face. So God's not only calling out to us, but he's also reaching out. The reaching out is an embrace of love. It's a sign of affection. And so where does God reach out to Moses? Now this is where, this, this is some cool stuff, right? This is where that deeper dive of teaching. Exodus 3, 4. When the Lord saw that he had approached, he answered the call. He's approaching God. God then reaches out. God called out to him from the bush. He says, Moses, Moses. Moses, Moses. Now God's not stuttering here. This isn't God stuttering. This, if you ever see in scripture where God says someone's name twice, it's a pattern of speech that would be known by Moses as called the repetition of endearment. Repetition of endearment. Moses, Moses, Michael, Michael, 
John, John, Sally, Sally. By addressing Moses through this pattern of speech in the ancient culture, he would have known that he was an expression of endearment, affection, friendship, or love. Moses would have understood immediately that he was being addressed by someone who loved him and was concerned about him. Moses, Moses. When Saul, who would one day be Paul, was walking down the Damascus road, an angel of the Lord appeared and said, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecute me? God expresses his love before he puts forth a request. He puts forth his love before he puts forth correction. Moses, Moses, he embraces him in his words of love. Before God asked Moses to do anything, he first affirms his love for him. I gotta ask you this, and I'm not asking for a logical response. I'm asking you from the depths of your heart, do you know that you are loved by God? I think there's Christians who live their whole Christian life who don't really know. Rationally, they know what scripture says, but it's not a reality in their own life. Because if, it ever, if there's ever a problem in your life, you're like, but God, if you, then do you, do you understand that God would never do evil towards you? You know, that God would never put you in a situation that you could not handle. Right? Do you understand God's unfailing love toward you? We don't deserve to be loved by God. But he gives us that love as a free gift. He chose, I love my creation. Mm. Point number three, God is taking out. Now what I did not say is I did not say God is taking you out. But God is taking obstacles and insecurities out of your life that have been holding you back. I don't have time to go into every single one, but Abraham, uh, Moses says, I'm not significant enough. And God says, I will be with you. What if they ask me who sent me? I am who I am. What if they don't listen to me? Well, what's in your hand? Use your staff. I'm not eloquent of speech. I will teach you what to say and what to speak. Just send someone else, please. He says, well, I'm gonna send Aaron with you. Every single time, God takes out the excuse and replaces it with faith. I know, I know sometimes in life we're like, God, just if you would just do the miracle, then I would believe. Joshua was called to lead his people around the walls of Jericho. And God said, walk around the walls and nothing's going to happen. Just keep walking. And then one day he says, shout. And the walls will fall down. And Joshua in his mind, he was probably like, well, make the walls fall down and give us something to shout about. I want you to know this. It takes no faith once a miracle happens. The miracle is the evidence that God did it. That takes no faith. There's no faith when you can see it. It's obvious, it's in front of us, it doesn't take faith. What takes faith is the unseen, is acting when you don't see it. This song that we're singing today, even when I can't feel it, I believe. Even when I can't see it, I believe. That's a, that's a hard place. That's a place of faith. It's a place of faith. I'm going to shout in victory even though I still feel pain. That's faith. That's faith. Believing without seeing. That's where we get stumped. That's where we get hung up. I call it comfort zone Christianity. I just want to be comfortable, God. I just want to be comfortable. I just don't want pain, but I don't need any victories. I just want to get by. I want to do just enough to get to heaven, but I don't need to do anything else. And God is saying, man, you're settling for a bootleg life. 
You're settling for a bootleg version of life. You're letting life live you and you're just getting by. You're reacting instead of taking initiative. I'm calling you to be more. I'm calling you to be a leader. I'm calling you to have a voice. I'm calling you to be an example. And you know what our part is? It was what Moses' part was. He had to say yes. That was the only stipulation. Now, he could have said no. He could have said no. And God would use somebody else. God, you know, the second one is probably Aaron. If Moses said no, he's probably going to Aaron next. He could have. But Moses said yes. And we're still studying about this guy today. This guy who was absolutely disqualified. He murdered somebody. He's disqualified. God uses him to deliver millions of people from slavery and bondage. Millions. A stuttering, murdering, lying, insecure leader. God used him. God used him to change a nation. I'm saying God's calling out to you today. He's calling out to you, he's reaching out to you, and he's taking obstacles out of your life. I wonder today if maybe there's someone in this room or watching online and you've never actually felt God reach out to you like you're feeling today. Like today's something speaking to you. Maybe today you got a little bit excited about your faith once again. Rekindled something in your Christianity that says, man, yeah, I can pursue God a little bit differently. Yeah, I can be an example. Yeah, I don't have to be so angry. Yeah, I don't have to have anxiety. I don't have to have depression. I don't have to live in the life that I'm living the way that I'm living. You know, God, would you take these obstacles out of my way? God, would you call out to me? I'm telling you this, God's calling out today. In a never-ending call, he's calling out starting today. I mean, starting 2,000 years ago, but here's another calling today that will span in the future. God's calling out to you to come home to his house, come home to his family. If you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, if you've never taken that step towards God, the one who's in the burning bush, the one who's at your house, the one who's at your job, you make that step towards him and he reaches out towards you. He called out to Moses, but then he reached out to him. And today's a reaching moment. See, today's the day of salvation. And here at Family Church, we accept that invitation. We say yes by praying what's called a prayer of salvation. A prayer that we all say together that reaffirms our faith, but also connects us to the heart of God and brings us into the family of God. If you're here today and you've never prayed that prayer before, would you join us today? It goes this, dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that, and you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started 